Hello, Mark. My name is Joy Li Chengxuan, and my student number is S O four four one O one five, and I'm a sophomore. I'm going to read a speech titled "What Makes Life Worth Living in the Face of Death," and the speaker is Lucy Kalanidis. A few days after my husband Paul was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, when we were lying in our bed at home, and Paul said, "It's going to be okay," and I remember answering back, "Yes, we just don't know what okay means yet." Paul and I had met as first-year medical student at Yale. He was smart and kind and super funny. He used to keep a gorilla suit in the trunk of his car, and he said, "It's for emergency only." Laughter. I fell in love with Paul as I watched the care he took with his patient. He stayed late talking with them, seeking to understand the experience of illness and. Not just its technicality. He later told me he fell in love with me when he saw me cry over an EKG of a heart that had ceased beating. We didn't know it yet, but even in the happy days of young love, we were learning how to approach suffering together. We got married and became daughters. I was working as an internist, and Paul was finishing his training as a neurosurgeon. When he started to lose weight, he developed excruciating back pain and a cold that wouldn't go away. And when he was admitted to the hospital, a CT scan revealed tumor in Paul's down lung. And in his bone, we had both cared for patients with devastating diagnosis. Now it was our turn. We lived with Paul's illness for 22 months. He wrote a minor memoir about facing mortality. I gave birth to our daughter, Katie, and we nursed her and. Each other, we learned directly how to struggle through really tough medical decision. The day we took Paul into the hospital for the last time was the most difficult day of my life. When he turned to me at the end and said, "I'm ready," I knew that wasn't just a brave decision. It was the right one. Paul didn't want a fainted. Later, and CPR. In that moment, the most important thing to Paul was to hold your our baby daughter. Nine hours later, Paul died. I always thought of myself as a caregiver, most physicians do, and taking care of Paul depends what they mean. Watching him reshape his. Identity during his illness, learning to witness and accept his pain, talking together through his choices. Those experiences told me that resi- resilience does not mean bouncing back to where you were before, or pretending that the hard stuff isn't hard. It's it is so hard. It's painful, messy stuff, but it's the stuff. And I learned that when when we approach it together, we get to decide what success looks like. One of the first things Paul said to me after his diagnosis was, "I want you to get remarried." And I was like, "Wow!" I guess we get to say anything out loud. Laughter. It was so shocking and heartbreaking, and generous, and really com- comforting.
because it was so stalking honest, and that honesty turned out to be exactly what we needed. Early in Paul's illness, when agreed to, when agreeing, we would just keep saying things out loud. Tests like making a will, or completing completing our advance directive, tests that I had always avoided, were not as daunting as that one thing. I realized that completing an advance directive is an act of love, like a wedding vow, a pact to take care of someone, codifying the promise that. Till death do us part. I will be there. If I need it, I will speak for you. I will honor your wishes. That paperwork became a tangible part of our love story. As physician, Pat and I were in a good position to understand and even accept his diagnosis. We were we weren't angry about it. Luckily. Because we've seen so many patients in devastating situation, and we knew that death is a part of life. But it's one thing to know that it was a very different experience to actually live with the sadness and uncertainty of a serious illness. Huge strides are being made against lung cancer, but we knew that Paul likely has much to a few. Years left to live. During that time, Paul wrote about his transition from doctor to patient. He talked about feeling like he was suddenly at a crossroad, and how he would have thought he was able to see the path. That because he treated so many patients, maybe he could follow in their footsteps. But he was totally disoriented, rather than a path. Paul wrote, "I saw instead only a harsh, fat, vacant, gleaming white desert, as if a sandstorm had erased all familiarity. I have to face my mortality and try to understand what made my life worth living, and I needed my oncologist to oncologist help to do so." The Clinician taking care of Paul gave me an even deeper appreciation for my colleague in healthcare. We have a tough job. We are responsible for helping patients have clarity around their prognosis and their treatment option, and that's never easy. But it's especially tough when you are dealing with potential. Potentially terminal illness like cancer. Someone, some people don't want to know how long that have left. Others do. Either way, we never have those answer. Sometimes we substitute hope by emphasizing the best care scenario. In a survey of physician, fifty-five percent said that that pain. A rouser picture than their honest option when describing a patient's prognosis. It's an instinct born out of kindness, but researchers have found that when people better understand the possible outcome of an illness, they have less anxiety, greater ability to plan, and less trauma for their families. Family can struggle with loss conversation. But for us, we also found that information immensely helpful with big decision, most notably whether to have a baby. Month to a few years, Ming Pei was not likely to see her grow up, but he had a good chance of being there for her, her birth and for her for the beginning of her life. I remember us asking Pei. If he saw having to say goodbye to a child would make dying even more painful, and his answer astounded me. He said, "Wouldn't it be great if it did?" And we did it. Now, in order to spike cancer, 
but because we were knowing that living poorly means accepting suffering. Post Uncle just tailored his camel so he could continue working as a neurosurgeon, which initially we thought was totally impossible. When a cancer advanced and post shoot from surgery to writing, his palliative care doctor prescribed a stimulant medication so he would be more focused. They asked about his priority and his worries. They asked him what trade-off he was willing to make. Those conversations are the best way to ensure that your health care matches your value. Talk to your dad is not like that bird and bee. Talk you you have with your parent. Well, you get it over with as quickly as possible and then pretend it never happened. You revisit the conversation as things change. You keep saying things out loud and forever grateful because post clinician feel that their job wasn't to try to give us answer that they didn't have or only to try to fix things for us, but to counsel Paul through painful choices when his body was falling but he, his will to live wasn't. Later, after Paul died, I received a dozen banquet of flour, and but I sent just one to Paul's oncologist because she spoiled support his school and hid helping with way his choices. He knew that living means more than just staying alive. A few weeks ago, a patient came into my clinic, a woman deal dealing with serious chronic disease. And while we were talking about her life and her health care, she said, I love my pediatric care team. They told me that it's okay to say no, yet I thought, of course it is, but many patients don't feel that compassion and choice did a study will let us people about their health care preference and a lot of people start their answer with the world. Well if I had a choice, if I had a choice and when I read that if I understand better I understood better why one in four people receive incessant and unwanted medical treatment or watches a family member receive excessive or unwanted medical treatment. It's not because doctors don't get it. We do, we understand the real psychological consequences on patients and their family. The thing is, we deal with them too. Half of critical care nurses and a quarter of ICU doctors had considered quitting their job because of this distra distress over feeling that for some of their parents that provide care that didn't fit with the person's value. But doctors can make sure your wishes are respect respected until they know that they are. Would you want to be on life support if it offer any chance of longer life? Are you most worried about the quality of that time rather than quantity? Both of these choices are thoughtful and brave, but for all of us, it's our choice. That's true at the end of life and for medical care throughout our life. If you are pregnant, do you want Dragnetting screening is a key. Is a knee replacement right or not? Do you want to do dialysis in a clinic or at home? The answer is it depends. What medical care will help you live the way you want to? I hope you remember that question the next time you face a decision in your health care. Remember that. You always have a choice, and it is okay to say no to a treatment that's not right for you. That's a point by W. S. Merwin. It's just two sentences long. They capture how I feel now. 
Your absence has gone through my leg, thread to a needle. Everything I do is stitched with its color. For me, that point is for my love for Poe, and a new fortitude that came from loving and losing him. When Poe said, "It's going to be okay," that didn't mean that we could cure his illness. Instead, we learn to accept both joy and sadness at the same time, to uncover beauty and purpose both despite and because we are all born and we are all die. And for all the sadness and sleepless night, it turns out that there is a joy. I leave flower on post graph and watches all two years or run around on the grass. I build bonfire on the beach and watch the sunset with our friend. Exercise and mindfulness meditation help have helped a lot, and someday I hope I do get remarried. Most importantly, I get to watch our daughter grow. I thought a lot about what I'm going to say to her when she's older. Katie engaging in the full range of experience, living and dying, love and loss is what we get to do. Being human doesn't happen despite suffering; it happens within it. When we approach suffering together, when we choose not to hide from it, our lives don't diminish; they expand. I learned that cancer isn't always a battle. Or if it is, maybe it's a fight for something different than we thought. Our job isn't to fight fat, but to help each other do. Not a soldier, but a shepherd. It's how we make it okay, even when it's not by saying out loud, by helping each other do. And a gorilla should never hurt either. Thank you. Applause.